moving on to, the, to our next segment. So one of the interesting articles that's been published this year has been this Pritchard article that was in the New England Journal of Medicine, which basically looked at DNA repair gene mutations in, what was it, over 600 patients with uh, metastatic prostate cancer. And what, what, what he reported on was this, this com compared to uh, data that, that was uh, in TCGA was this tremendous, close to 12 percent incidence of germline mutations. And these were patients that were non-selected for a history of prostate cancer. And what they found was obviously this, that there, there seems to be this, this uh, higher incidence of primarily BRCA2 mutations that exists or that occurs in patients that, who, are, who have metastatic prostate cancer. So I think what this opens up now is, again, as we move forward with, with genetic counseling and we, we, we are looking more towards screening controversies and those things, what role does BRCA1, BRCA2 testing play as we, as we see either newly diagnosed patients with prostate cancer, people that come to us who have a family history of prostate cancer, maybe they have a family history of breast, ovarian, colon, pancreatic, you know, I mean, how, you know, what's, what's going to be the role of this, do you think, Ash? Well, well I think a, a, couple, a couple of things, and we'll, we'll get uh, to it as uh, down the road, too. One is uh, um, it's important for the audience to know that the cell cycle um, regulation and DNA repair is really a cascade. Um, BRCA1 and BRCA2 are involved in homologous recombination. There's other genes that they were looking at, too, because it was really a deep sequencing approach, ATM, NBS1, MRE11, et cetera. Um, and they had this surprising finding, like you said, 12% of metastatic men had a germline, so you know, every cell in their body had some mutation there. And what I found extremely surprising myself was, it, just like you pointed out, family history of prostate cancer didn't seem to play a big role, but history of any cancer seemed to play a role. And I would have expected the men to be, you know, younger, that the younger men would have the mutations, but it wasn't, that wasn't the case either. It, it, kind of giving up the... Uh, idea that there's probably multiple hits or, or genetic interactions that are necessary for this. And so there's two places where knowledge of the BRCA1 or 2 or DNA break repair status are going to be important. One, which I'm sure we'll touch on in a little bit, is in the person with castrate resistant prostate cancers progressing through therapies. Is there a role for PARP inhibitors or platinum-based therapies in that, in that gentleman? But the second is the concept that this, uh, that this group and, you know, Peter Nelson has talked about of using these men as, as sentinels for, um, so a man comes in with metastatic um, prostate cancer, regardless of whether they're naive or hormone naive or not, we've um, institutionally been moving towards testing them for their germline status to allow kind of alerting their family members of, you know, you have a uh, germline mutation that might put you at higher risk for malignancies in general, particularly breast cancer for the female uh, family members. What do you do with the man, and we are still debating this, with the man who comes in who has low risk prostate cancer, and they're say they're 70 with a small volume Gleason 6 tumor, but, you, but you've identified them as having a BRCA1 you know, mutation or BRCA2 mutation. We don't really understand that at all. And uh, I think that, you know, the um, one thing that we'll do as this is becoming more commonplace and, and easier and less expensive to test the germline status is we'll have to collect that data in a registry and see if it does play any, any part in what's going on. And a final uh, kind of interesting note is we now can start to, about 6% of the high-risk men had germline mutations. Somatic mutations might be, might be even more common. PARP inhibitors are not exceptionally well tolerated, but fairly well tolerated. Can we start to think about moving them up earlier into, into space and doing combination trials? These, I stress, should be small, you know, phase two trials and looking at efficacy, maybe combining them with radiation, which is also damaging DNA. So, Jorge, so for the urologists who, who really, we've got zero experience with PARP inhibitors, give us sort of an overview and sort of your experience just in general. So, so uh, great, thank you. Uh, so, so the, fr the first thought that I have is tumor genomics and prostate cancer, right? So, um, I think that the, the challenge with tumor genomics and what we're trying to go from personalized medicine into precision, precision, precision medicine, excuse me, is the fact that 
you may get a, a list of genes that you may have aberrations on, but you may not be able to act on those changes, right, which is the challenges that we find with whatever platform you use, foundation medicine or what have you. So I personally think that uh, for me, if you have a hypomethylation or a DNA deleterious mutation, whether it's ATM, BRCA1 or BRCA2, or the Fanconian imaging, whatever, at this point, it doesn't really change my therapeutics. And the reason why is because although TOPARP, which is the trial that actually uh, our French colleagues actually published on first before actually the uh, uh, Fritcher's data, uh, we know that there is a response rate when you use a PARP inhibitor. You know, the only FDA approved PARP inhibitor in the United States right now is Olaparinib, which is approved in ovarian cancer. Now, they have a breakthrough registration in front of the FDA for prostate, but they're not yet there. So AstraZeneca has a trial right now in prostate selecting patients, right? Which is a challenge because what you mentioned, right? It's only around, in, in the Prechard data, it's actually less than 6% who are BRCA1 and BRCA2, right? If you look at all the mutations that they look, it actually was around 11%. So a screening 100 men just to find 10 patients is very costly unless you can actually, you can swing that, that, that bill to some extent. So we are not adopting germline screen for everybody, you know, and, and to some extent, as, as you mentioned, uh, Ash, I would be, I was surprised because I would have predicted if you were 40 and you had really aggressive disease, maybe that's the guy that I want to look into. But at this stage, if I see a patient, let's say, that comes with, you know, a report and says, I'm ATM mutant or I have a BRCA deletion, you know, I simply tell them, your, your, uh, your cancer is going to be far more aggressive and more than likely I'm going to be able to expose you to a PARP inhibitor. At this point, the, me, the biggest question for me clinically is, if I haven't treated you yet with ABI, with ENSA, with radium, with docetaxa, would I change those treatments and put you in a PARP inhibitor? I'm not sure that, that data, the data we have would support that approach. Having said that, if you have seen every single treatment, right, and you have happened to have one of these hypermethylations, a somatic change or a, a germline change, then there is no other option, and maybe we can actually resort and try to actually use a PARP inhibitor. There are over six or seven companies right now that are looking at different PARP inhibitors, right? So as you can imagine, the next wave of agents that we're going to be testing prostate cancer are not going to be the PD-1 alone, they're going to be the PARP inhibitors. The biggest challenge that we are facing as a group is, are we going to be selecting out? And if we believe that up to 90% of those patients who really have these mutations are the ones that truly benefit from therapy, then the question is, it's going to be a very small niche, right? I mean, maybe used for that is small niche of patients, but what happens to our 90% of patients, right? So I think that to the extent of where we are, unless we have randomized phase three data, I mean, this is probably the only space where we may be able to swing a placebo trial again in the post heavily pretreated patients to get a PARP or to get nothing. And they, those are the trials that we're conducting right now. Alicia, what's your experience with PARP inhibitors? So, so I've actually used them in, in ovarian, but I have not used them in prostate. And I think one of the important things that I would stress with all of this is that you know, the, the Mateo paper, the De Bono Mateo paper, actually uh, looked at mutations that were somatic mutations. So mutations that were in, in the tumor after exposure to prior treatments. And I think we may find that we're able to incorporate PARP inhibitors in that space much more easily, uh, as Jorge is saying, because the, the mutation rate is much higher, or at least it appeared to be so in the Mateo paper. So we're talking closer to 30% rather than the 12% that we see in germline. And conceivably, we should see a similar benefit from the PARP inhibitors in that space. And in, in the Mateo study, I think we saw response rates in those patients who had mutations uh, around 88% or so. It was a high, it was a high response rate. Um, so I think it's germline mutations are important, but I think it's mo much more important, and we are sequencing more, more um, intensively, actually, uh, biopsy samples right. because the somatic mutations may actually be more useful. And as we move through all of this, I think it's important to think about how we're going to support these patients and their families in terms of genetic counseling because if this is the direction in which we're moving, we are going to find things that are going to affect more than just the patient, and we need to have a strategy to, to support them. But in general, PARP, PARP inhibitors are, I would say, not as easily tolerated as things like abiraterone and enzalutamide. And so I am inclined to stick with those tried and true therapies first. But should I have a patient who has a mutation and has already received all of the approved agents, I think a PARP inhibitor is great. The other thing I would think about is something like carboplatin, because it does look like these patients may be more sensitive to platin, platinum agents. And carboplatin is already approved. So we can get that, and we can get it pretty easily off the shelf. 
So what does the side effect profile look like just in general with some of these PARP inhibitors? So I've seen fatigue as probably the, the most challenging issue. You can see cytopenias as well and some GI distress. I'm not sure if Jorge has, has other issues that he's come across, but I would say fatigue and the cytopenias are probably the biggest ones from my end. I think cytopenias and, and obviously, you know, it brings, becomes an issue, right, when you have a patient who has been heavily prescribed with chemotherapy, right, if you have seen six cycles of docetaxel, or if you have seen more than six cycles, right, and then Jeftana, right, I mean, and you come back with a PARP inhibitor, you know, and on top of that radium, if you will, if you use it earlier, those patients may have more malosuppression than, than the average patient. I actually have used PARP inhibitors quite a bit because uh, I, I was able to pin down a couple patients who had aggressive disease in three or five patients that I have. One that I was actually, I knew when I met him had uh, BRCA, uh, BRCA, uh, uh, BRCA deletion. He actually progressed on AVI, right? Uh, he got charted type of therapy, hormones, chemo, progressed biochemically. We repeated scans, no evidence of disease because his initial volume was soft tissue and that was meltdown by therapy. So he progressed, I put him on AVI because I knew he had metastatic disease. He progressed within uh, probably nine months or so. Uh, he didn't want more chemotherapy and then the Topar data came out and I said, you know what, maybe your BRCA, let me just see if I can actually get you a PARP inhibitor. I was able to get him a PARP inhibitor, had a PSA response, um, a 90% PSA decline for around five to six months and then progress. And then the question was then what else to do at that time? You know, and, and so I think they're short-lived, they're real, but I don't think these patients are achieving complete responses. More important than that, I think that uh, when you look at actually uh, the, the, the data from the PARP data, you know, uh, the question would be, would those patients who have visceral disease, the ones that we may want to actually really actually use a PARP inhibitor, maybe in combination with a platinum-based therapy, right, to increase their uh, uh, response, make it more durable, uh, because we know for those patients there may be a neuroendocrine behavior, but they may also be driven by BRCA. 